Welcome to this edition of Cranmer's Studies, the work of our doctoral dissertation. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We're in Dr. Gerald Bray's Documents of the English Reformation and reading William Tyndale's Preface to the Bible and 15 not sure of the exact date here, but Cranmer is well advanced in his studies with his doctorate. At least is maybe 1523, some say 1526, and a full three years devoted to the study of sacred scripture. Pick up here. The, the um, This, have I said, this is... I intend to warn thee, lest thou should be deceived, and seek, and should not only read the scriptures in vain to no profit, but also to your greater condemnation. For the nature of God's word is that whosoever read or hear it reasoned and disputed before him will begin immediately to make him every day better and better. Hi, Mary. We're reading Tyndale on his preface to the Bible. Till he be grown into a perfect man in the knowledge of Christ and love of the law of God. The Bible is often called in the Wycliffean forms the law of God, the word of God. Or else the reading of the Bible will make him worse and worse. Till he's hardened his heart that he openly resists the spirit of God. And then blasphemes after the example of Pharaoh, Korah. Abiram, Balaam, Judas, Simon Magus, and others. This is, oh good, I'm glad, Mary, to hear you subscribe to Global Anglican. Global Anglican has given me renewed hope. Because I don't get out a whole lot, and I'm in the Episcopal Church, and we got a good rector and good people there. But the bishop's a no-load. He doesn't talk theology. So the Episcopal Church is in dire trouble with apostasy and heresy. But the global Anglican still believes in the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. And that's evident throughout in the article. So there is a live and active Bible-believing Anglican community in the world. And the global Anglican has helped me with that background to be refreshed and renewed. So back to Tyndale. This is to be even so with the words of Christ, do well confirm. This is condemnation, says Jesus, that light has come into the world, but the men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were very evil. Behold, when the light of God's word comes to any man, whether he read or hear it preached and testified, and yet he has no love thereto to fashion his life thereafter, but consents unto his old deeds in ignorance, then the just condemnation begins, and he is henceforth without excuse in that he refused the mercy offered to him. Again, William Tyndale. Regard, and I have a high regard for Tyndale. For God offereth him mercy upon condition that he will mend his life. And he will not come under the covenant. Apart from that hour forward, he waxes worse and worse. And God takes his spirit of mercy and grace from him for his unthankfulness. All of this is before the official break of the Church of England with Rome. Paragraph 12, as Paul writes in Romans 1, 21 and 26, that the heathen, because they knew God, had no lust, no desire to honor him with godly living. Therefore, God poured out his wrath upon them and took his spirit from them and gave them up unto their own hearts, lusts, to serve people from iniquity to iniquity. And Pharaoh, who heard God's word, let my people go, 
because the word of God was in his country and God's people were scattered throughout all the land and yet neither loved them or the word of God. God gave him up and in taking his spirit of grace and the word from him so hardened his heart with covetousness so that afterwards not even a miracle could convert him. I'd forgotten about Pharaoh. Heretofore pertaineth the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. The Lord commandeth the talents to be taken away from the evil and the slothful servant, and to bind him hand and foot and cast him into utter darkness, and to give the talent to the man who had ten, saying, To all that have, more shall be given. But from him that hath not, that, he, that which he hath has taken from him. That is to say, he that has a good heart toward the word of God and a set purpose to fashion his deeds thereafter and to garnish with godly living and to testify to it shall increase more and more daily in the grace of Christ. But he that loveth God's word not to live thereafter and edify others the same shall lose the grace of true knowledge and be blinded again. And every day wax worse and worse and blinder and blinder till he be an utter enemy of God's word. Paragraph 15 and Luke 12, 47. The servant that knoweth his master's will and prepareth it not himself shall be beaten with many stripes, that is, shall have greater damnation. And Matthew 7, 26, all that hear the word of God and do not thereafter, they build on sand, that as the foundation laid on sand, cannot resist the violence of water, but is undermined and overthrown. Even so the faith of them that have no lust nor love of God's word build upon the sand of their own imaginations and not upon the rock of God's word. Turneth to his desperation in time of tribulation when God comes as a judge. And then the vineyard in Matthew 21, 33 to 34, 41. The vine dresser planted and hired out to the husbandman that he would not render to the Lord the fruit in due time, and therefore was taken from them, and it was hired out to another, confirms the same. For Christ said to the Jews, The kingdom of heaven shall be taken from you and given to a nation that shall bear fruit there, thereof. For the Jews have lost the spiritual knowledge of God and of his commandments and all the scripture so that they can understand nothing godly. The door is so locked up that all their knocking is in vain, though many of them take great pain for God's sake. Luke 13, 6 through 9. And finally, hitherto pertaineth with infinite other terrible, the terrible parable of the unclean spirit, Luke 11, 12 to 26 which after he is cast out, when he comes and finds the house well swept and garnished, taketh to him seven worse than himself, and comes and enters and dwells therein. And so the end of the man is the worse than he was in the beginning. The Jews, they had cleansed themselves with God's word from all outward idolatry and worshiping of idols. But their hearts remain still faithless toward God and toward his mercy and truth. And there too, without love and lust to his law and to their neighbors for his sake and through false trust in their own works, to which heresy the child of perdition, the wicked bishop of Rome with his lawyers have brought us Christians were more abominable idolaters than before and become ten times worse in the end than at the beginning. For the first idolatry was soon spied and easy to be rebuked of the prophets by scripture. But the latter is more subtle to beguile 
and a hundred times the more difficulty to be weeded out of men's hearts. This is also a conclusion, nothing more certain or proved by the testimony and example of scriptures, that if any favoreth the word of God be so weak that he cannot chasten his flesh, him will the Lord chastise and scourge every day sharper of tribulation and misfortune. And we'll pick this up again as we ponder William Tyndale in the 1520s in his preface to the Bible. We turn now to Professor Edgecombe, Philip Edgecombe Hughes's Theology of the English Reformers on the subject of preaching and worship. We've seen some wonderful statements by bishops and archbishops. And again, it goes to Barry's point here with Global Anglican, that this is the real Anglican church, which is Bible loving Bible, thinking Bible, living Bible, expounding historically. When Article 23 of the 39 Articles declares, quote, it is not lawful for any man to take upon himself the office of public preaching or ministering the sacraments of the congregation before he be lawfully called and sent to execute the same. And it does not follow from this fact that the layman has no responsibilities of witness and communication. There is also such a thing as preaching by the quality of one's living. Every quote, every man, private man ought to be in virtuous living, both the light and salt to his neighbor, says William Tyndale, when expounding Christ's words, ye are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Tyndale goes on, insomuch that the poorest ought to strive to overrun the bishop and preach to him an example of living. Moreover, every man ought to preach in word and deed unto his own household, and to them that are under his gar gar governance, close quote. The Christian layman, therefore, has a further obligation to study and instruct himself in the word of God, so much that he is in a position to reprove false teaching, no matter from whose mouth he hears it. Thus William Tyndale, whom we were just reading, continues, and he's an English reformer, quote, and though no man may preach openly, save he that has the office committed to him, Yet ought every man endeavor to be well learned just as much as the preacher, as nigh as it is possible. And the preacher and the bishop too, if need be. For if the preacher preach wrong, then may any man, whatsoever he be, rebuke him first privately, and then if that not help, complain further. And when all is proved according to the order of charity and love, and yet no amendment be had, then every man ought to resist that preacher and to stand by Christ's doctrine and to jeopard life, jeopardize life and all of it. Close quote. This is a good example of the practical implications of the Reformed emphasis on the sovereignty of God's word, which is placed above all human and ecclesiastical authority. Tyndale indeed asserts the right of the least man in the realm to reprove even the king should he decree whatsoever is contrary to God's word. Quote, Though every man's body and goods be under the king, do he right or wrong, says Tyndale, yet the authority of God's word free and above the king so that the worst in the realm may tell the king, if he do him wrong, that he does, otherwise than God has commanded him, and so warn him to avoid the wrath of God. As for the ecclesiastical authorities, he puts and answers the following questions. You can see Tyndale's extremely high view of God's word. Have I no power to resist the bishop or preacher 
that with false doctrine slays souls for whom my master and Lord Jesus hath shed his blood, but we otherwise under our bishops than Christ and his apostles and all the prophets were under the bishops of the old law? Nay, verily. And therefore we may, and also as they did, and to answer as the apostles did, apportet magus obedier deum quam omnibus. We ought to obey God rather than men. In the gospel, every man is Christ's disciple and a person for himself to defend Christ's doctrine in person. The faith of the bishop will not help me, nor the bishop's keeping the law be sufficient for me. But I must believe in Christ for the remission of all my sin, for mine own self, and in my own person. No more is the bishops or preachers defending of God's word enough for me, but I must defend it in my own person and jeopardize life and all thereon to defend it when I see need and occasion. To this principle, Tyndale remained inflexibly true in his life as well as his martyrdom when he was caught, killed, and burned at the stake in October 1536 or 37. There's debate on the date. Now we turn to William Latimer's sermon on the plow. He was removed from his arch, uh, his Episcopal see. When it was re-offered to him, he did not want it, too much hassle, and so he retired to Lambeth Palace and lived with Thomas Cranmer on his staff, continuing to preach but not exercise Episcopal duties. Among the varied documents, the English Reformation, none are more informative concerning the state of preaching in England at that time and also concerning the reform doctrine of preachings than are the sermons of him who was the most remarkable preacher of the day and indeed one of the greatest preachers the church universal has ever had, old Bishop Hugh Latimer. In this chapter, therefore, we draw freely upon his famous sermons, most famous perhaps of all is Latimer's Sermon of the Plough, which was preached in London on 18 February, 1548, a year after Henry had died. Latimer explains that God's word is seed. The congregation is the field in which the seed is grown. And the preacher is the plowman, far for preaching of the gospel is one of God's plow works and the preacher is one of God's plowmen. Just as there is no time of the year when the plowman on his farm has not special work to do, so too the preacher has enough to keep him fully occupied. He has first a busy work to bring his parishioners, parishioners to a right faith, and then to confirm them in the same now casting them down with law and threatenings of God for sin, and ridging them up with the gospel and with the promises of God's favor, now weeding them by telling out their faults and making them forsake sin, now clotting them by breaking their stony hearts and making them supple-hearted and making them to have hearts of flesh that is soft hearts, and apt for doctrine to enter in. And we'll pick that up with Bishop Hugh Latimer as we turn to Thomas Cranmer and Margot Johnson's collection of essays. And we'll just briefly talk here about Brian Spink's article on the worthy, or Hugh Bates' article on the worthy communicant. talking about the prayer book.
Here, forgiveness is conditional on the penitent turning to Almighty God with hearty repentance and true faith. The force of the comfortable words in Holy Communion is now fully apparent, giving assurance and comfort to the penitent by these incontrovertible and indisputable promises of Scripture, of God's mercy that is beyond all shadow of doubt. But these are already present in 1548, which would indicate that the same interpretation is placed on the absolution as well. Possibly this is the only difficulty for those who've become accustomed to hearing the invitation, confession, and absolution outside the context of the foregoing exhortations. And we're talking about prayer book details here. At this point, the intending communicant will have known what is expected of him or her. They will have considered the saving passion of Christ and the nature and purpose of the sacrament which they are about to receive, Holy Communion. In one form or another, they will have made an act of penitence for their past sins. They will be reconciled to their neighbors in love and charity. So now they may approach the sacrament, certainly not in a spirit of presumption, but in trusting in God's promises and the merits of Jesus Christ. If they can affirm all this of themselves with their heads, hands on their hearts, as it were, then they are indeed making a difference in Christ's body, and they will truly and spiritually eat to their comfort and assurance though, with those words of institution in his gospel and commanded to continue as a perpetual memory of his precious death and coming again. On the surface and in the broad outline, the order for Holy Communion of 1548 may not be altogether untypical of what would have happened in the medieval church when communion was administered to the people. This may have been very much the exception rather than the rule, but it did happen on occasion and needed to be accommodated when it did. How this was actually done was left in large memor to the discretion of the celebrant. An example of this is found in the Harclayan manuscript 2383 this comprises a vernacular exhortation preceded by a form of private confession and followed by a long absolution. Here also the stated requirement for receiving the sacrament is proper faith and hearty penitence leading up to a rudimentary and a basic general confession continue the thinking on the Holy Communion, a wonderful service, even to this day, although it has suffered neglect by affirming right two over right one, regrettably. Turn now to Prof. McCulloch on Thomas Cranmer in the period of 1539 to 1542, and the salvaging of the cause and the six articles of 1539. Opinions differ as to whether or not the five May committee's appointments was in fact a front to disguise the fact that the king's mind was already made up upon the broad shape of policy. Henry was back and forth and I'm convinced despite some positive reporting on Henry, that he still died a devout Roman Catholic without the Pope. He put up with a lot from Thomas Cranmer. There's a, there's a weird relationship where Henry protects him, despite even after Cromwell's death, uh, the cards are stacked against him, and the betting, those betting on the odds were convinced that Cranmer was going to follow Cromwell to the scaffold. Anyways, back to it. What is beyond dispute is that on 16 May, 
The Duke of Norfolk abruptly announced in the House of Lords that the committee had not been able to agree on anything. Just as he observed sourly, some peers had predicted when it was appointed. He therefore felt it best if the House of Lords considered six specific doctrinal questions, which are recorded in the House of Lords journal. They, there were the first glimpse of these six articles, which would eventually be embodied in an act of Parliament, sometimes called the Six Whips. When they move way beyond a simple concern with the sacrament of the altar, the fact that the Duke of Norfolk was the agent in the announcement is itself significant. Norfolk was the embodiment of lay traditionalism. The Duke became the butt of an anecdote which circulated in Cranmer's household about the aftermath of the Six Articles debacle. In this story, Norfolk acted as an unwilling straight man to one of the Archbishop's more spirited evangelical protégés in a barbed exchange about clerical celibacy. The bald record of the House of Lords proceedings in a journal goes on, <clears throat> revealing procedurally unusual occurrences which indicate that events were swinging wildly out of Cromwell's control, if not the King's. There were constant fluctuations in attendance among the churchmen in late May, probably indicating their absence in private bottles as they fought over what was happening. Henry presided in person in the Lords on North 19 and 21 May 1539, and he may also have been meeting groups of bishops for private discussions. John Hussey described the same sequence of events to Lord Lyle on May 21, that there is a great hold among the bishops for the establishment of the blessed sacrament of the altar. The lords have sat in council upon the same, and the king's highness hath been with them sundry times in person. Cranmer is among those recorded as present every day from 19 May. Jasper Ridley is almost certainly correct in supposing that he put up the main opposition to the articles at this time while the king was frequently in the house. We know very little of what he said, apart from some rather vague reports in Fox. The best summary information is in a fragment copied from a letter of one of the secular nobility present in the Lord's. He gleefully recorded the evangelicals' discomfiture, including the unenthusiastic duty, dutifulness of Chancellor Audley and Cromwell in the face of the king's sudden decisiveness, and described the six articles as they stood at the end of May. And that horrific story will be resumed at another time. Now for Arthur Innes, the hand of Cromwell. I'm jumping around here on time. And the monastic institutions under any circumstances are open to grave objections, though it would be absurd to speak of them as altogether bad. Even a band of enthusiasts bound to resist the allurements of the world and flesh for themselves and do battle with the devil for others. Some misapprehensions as to legitimate pleasures, some errors as to the method of conducting war with evil, do not destroy the value of a self-denying example. But the monastic system is by its nature particularly liable to abuse. If moral enthusiasm fades, principles and practice soon find themselves in contradiction, and the corrupting influence of misconduct is intensified. Vows taken before a novice realizes what's involved in them became a burden too great to be borne. 
and the favor of stolen fruit is proverbial. From the earliest times, monks have been anathematized for abusing their profession. The tongue of scandal at all times loved to dwell upon their misdeeds. And there is a tolerably strong presumption that the tongue of scandal was not without excuse. For example, mon monasteries with housewives running around and with little children. The legal benefit of clergy protected them from the penalties by a lay criminal had a moral counterpart and complement in the abuse of sacerdotal authority, providing both the opportunity for ill-doing and comparative immunity from results. In other words, how corrupt were, morally speaking, the mon monasteries? They did some very good work, and that should be kept in balance. We get manuscripts from them, and there were times when they were devout and effective. But they're going to close down 800 of them in Cromwell's time. It's inconceivable that communities which enriched the exchequer by the exhibition of sham relics and the concoction of fraudulent miracles should have escaped serious blunting of the moral sense. And though the tales of such miracles and relics was no doubt exaggerated, at least so far as concerned willful deception, their general prevalence is beyond dispute. The inducement to what may euphemistically be called the lack of discipline must have been immense throughout the whole class of exempt monasteries, houses, that is, they were exempt from Episcopal visitation. We'll pick that up again, the whole issue of the mon monasteries. Now for a lovely volume by Leslie Williams, Emblem of Faith Untouched, a uh, kind of book that you might want to get for an aunt or uncle with no background, and Thomas Cranmer. And we're talking about the Archbishop Cranmer when he gets chosen in 1533. We pick up here in this chapter 6. The Emperor's ambassador, that'd be Charles, Charles I, yeah. Eustace Chapuy, the ambassador, however, knew the score and wrote to the emperor, trying to get him to encourage the pope to delay. Chapuy was too late. The papal permission to install Cranmer arrived at the end of March 1533. Immediately setting aside other issues, the Canterbury Convocation reconvened after Passion Sunday, March 30 to consecrate Thomas Cranmer as Archbishop of Canterbury. Meeting at St. Stephen's College in the Palace of Westminster, next to Cranmer's lodgings, the official body took the first steps to change the English church from a branch of the Roman communion into a national independent church body. For the previous 400 years, New archbishops had sworn two oaths of loyalty, the first to the Pope and the second oath to the King. On March 30, Cranmer knelt and swore to be a faithful and obedient servant to the Holy Peter, to the Holy Roman Church of the Apostles, and to my Lord Clement VII and his successors. Cranmer accepted the pallium as symbol of his office, then he took the traditional oath of allegiance to the king in respect to Henry's temporalities of lands and goods, swearing to renounce and forsake all such clauses, words, sentences, and grants which I have of the Pope's holiness in his bulls of the Archbishopric of Canterbury, that in any manner was or is or may be hurtful or prejudicial to your highness. 
through these, though these two oaths have been sworn, had been sworn back to back for centuries, this time was different. Again, this is 1533, March 30. For both Henry and Cranmer knew it was different. Under the current circumstances, Cranmer was nervous about the implications of having to make two diametrically opposed oaths. Civil lawyers had quieted his conscience on this morally dubious maneuver by citing the examples of several other reformers. Cranmer assuaged his own conscience by preparing a protestation before a notary and before witnesses, declaring that the oath to the Pope would not, would not trump his loyalty to God and King or anything that would hinder the reformation of the Christian religion, the government of the English church, or the prerogative of the crown. Cranmer's detractors claimed he committed perjury. Fans say he was being morally scrupulous. I would say that he was being morally scrupulous. We turn now to Trump, Paul Aris's Thomas Cranmer, churchman and scholar. And we're talking about his liturgical work. Uh, where were we? We are over here. On the sacrament of the altar, a hot issue in the Reformation. Who of his inestimable mercy and love towards us that we should have perfect hope, strength, comfort, and joy in him. This is why I like liturgy, because it's so serious. So that we should have continual remembrance of his most dear charity showed towards us in his death and passion. Did institute this sacrament as a perpetual memory of his mercy and wonderful work of our redemption and perpetual food and nourishment. And also in the fourth commandment for the mass, this would be the 1549, wherein the consecration is really at present, the very blessed body and blood of Christ is celebrate in the church for a perpetual memory of his death and passion. Here is an official doctrinal treatise has become the source for liturgical language. However, Cranmer was committed to reformation and even if he could make use of the phraseology of the king's book. By 1548 and 49, those were turning points in the Church of England, he was unable to accept all its views about the Eucharist. No more Luther, no more Rome, no more Constantinople. The contemporary disputes about the sacrifice of the Mass and the real presence exerted an implicit influence. Well, not implicit, it was explicit as he debated 14 to 18 December in the House of Lords for 1548 for the Reformed view of the sacrament. Cranmer was well, views, well versed in the views of Luther on the Eucharist. He also knew of Oiko Lampadius and Zwingli Attempts have been made to claim him for one school or the other, though Peter Brooks is almost certainly correct to describe his views as Swiss, Swiss, reformed, but not of one particular school. He was Swiss. He was reformed. Ultimately, Cranmer's view on the Eucharist can only be described as Cranmerian or Swiss, or Reformed, or Calvinistic, or Bucerian. The Eucharist was, without a doubt, a storm center and a flashpoint in England, particularly in the year or so before the appearance of the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. Some of the disputes and discussions are reflected in the 1549 Eucharistic Rite, more <clears throat> broadly, the Book of Homilies, 1547, 
give some indication of the doctrinal framework in which Cranmer compiled his liturgical rites. Revision in the light of use and critique. Most of the continental reformers seem to have staged their liturgical reforms in at least two parts, moving from moderate reform to that of a more radical nature. Cranmer's 1549 rites seem moderate, whereas those of 1552 were more radically Protestant. That's quite the word, radically. The revision took place in the wake of controversy, controversy and invited discussion. On the question of the Eucharist and sacramental efficacy, Cranmer had to do battle with Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester. Gardner published his work on the sacrament, pronouncing the 1549 rite as not being very far off from the Roman Catholic faith. Cranmer retaliated in a written work, and I didn't say retaliate there. Who's writing this? Brian Spinks. I, retaliate is not the word. Refuting Gardner point by point. But the greatest refutation was contained in a drastic, there's another bad word, revision of the Eucharistic rite. He was reformed. He wasn't into the Anglo bone muncher cruncher view. He was not a cannibal. He saw the issues that went back to Berengarius in the ancient church. And Fulz, Fulzpa of Ruspa, Fulgentius. And Wycliffe in the 14th century. And Berto of Kip Corby. And Elfric of Northern England in the late 9th, 10th century. So using words like drastic here are overdone by this scholar. It is significant that in a number of places, the phraseology Cranmer used to reply to Gardner is reproduced in the prayers of the 1552 Common Book, Book of Common Prayer. So, Cranmer was reformed on the Eucharist. We turn now to uh, Jasper Ridley's most excellent volume, and he's retailing the fall of Cromwell here. Trying to find out where did we let off at. Uh, I believe it's here. Herbert writes that no, it's over here. Thurlby. When he heard of the arrest of Norfolk and Surrey at Christmas 1546, he wrote to Paget, I would write unto you if I could against these two ungracious, ingrate, and inhuman non homines, the Duke of Norfolk and his son. Is that Cranmer? Because that's very uncranmerian to write with that kind of directness. The elder of whom I confess that I did love, for that I ever supposed him a true servant of his master. Well, it could be. Cranmer could switch the, the argument quickly. Like as both his allegiance and manifest benefits of the king's majesty bound him to have. And it's Cranmer on Norfolk. But now when I should begin to write to you herein, before God, I am so amazed at the matter. This is Cranmer. And I know not what to say. He always has an escape clause. Some say Cranmer was artless. No, he was quite the man of real politique. Therefore, I shall leave them to receive for their deeds as they have worthily deserved. But Cranmer could not maintain his upright attitude without being involved in the utter ruin. He was not required, as in the case of Anne Boleyn, to play a vital part in the proceedings against Cromwell. But he was present in the House of Lords on the 19th of June for the second and third readings of the Bill of Attainder, which condemned Cromwell to death without permitting him to appear in his own defense. 
as the records state that the bill was carried with the consent of all who were present without a single dissentient voice. It's clear that Cranmer declared himself in favor of it, or at least it allowed to go through with unanimous approval. Although the bill condemned Cromwell, not only as a traitor, but as a heretic, and sentenced him to be hanged, drawn, quartered, or burned at the king's pleasure. Cromwell's heresy was stated in the statute to consist of having encouraged Barnes and other heretics and disseminated heretical books. Cranmers himself had done as much, both as regards doctrine and protection of reformers, as his old colleague, whom he by now by his vote sentenced to be burned for these offenses. Cranmer was now required for the third time to play a leading part divorcing Henry from his queen. On this occasion, he did not sit alone as judge, for the case was tried by convocation. But it's difficult to minimize Cranmer's role in the hurried and highly questionable divorce of Anne of Cleves, though Gardner, who welcomed the divorce far more than Cranmer, certainly played a more prominent part. Cranmer was one of the six members of the House of Lords who asked Henry to permit the convocation to determine the validity of the marriage. And here we'll bring this to an end. If God be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat>